Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on Contending for the Word. Today's topic is going to be a bit interesting. Um, Dave Jenkins and I have been doing a lot of research on this the past few weeks, and I personally actually attended the the showing of this film that we are going to be reviewing today so that well, I could do it in fairness and objectivity, and I shared the notes with Dave, and also I did an audio recording of it, so that way we could fairly assess things, and we've listened to several videos um, prior to the release, and then after that were from um, some of these individuals. So we wanted to evaluate the film today called The Domino Revival, and to express some things that were stated, to um, offer some consideration and critique, even some pushback on some things, and to offer some um, some thoughts as to what revival looks like biblically, um, what the concerns are surrounding this film. I know some people um, may get upset or they may be a bit um, bothered by the fact that we're approaching this and saying, well, are you against revival? Are you against people coming to saving faith in Christ? We do acknowledge that the Bible um, talks about not the word revival, but it shows what revival looks like as far as God's people and their response to God. And so we wanted to talk about this topic today, knowing that it's going to be um, probably pushing some buttons for people, but we want to come at this um, with graciousness. And we also want to come at it with uh, presenting the truth firmly, but yet in love. So uh, Dave, as always, I'm so glad to be part of contending for the word and to be helping others that are um, watching as we do this. It's always a privilege to have you and Doreen and the other people that we're going to have joined soon um, uh, with contending for the word. So, um, you know, I, I echo what you just said, and 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 really the the the, the heart of this uh, episode is a couplefold. One, it's a concern to speak to those that that are in deliverance ministry, uh, to speak to now leaders of the movement because they're paying attention. Uh, also, to speak to those who are Christians and maybe they have questions about it. So we want to aim to equip you and help you. And, and help you to stand fast on the word alone. So I'll toss it back to Don and uh, we'll, we'll continue on. So this film, The Domino Revival, was released last month on October 24th on a Tuesday evening. And it is set to air again in November on November 13th um, of this year. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. But this is supposed to be a documentary, and it's featuring quite a few people in it. There's people I was not uh, familiar with, but there are people that I was familiar with. So there are people in it, such as Mike Signorelli, who is the director of the film, The Domino Revival. He's the one that actually coined that phrase or that term and, and creating the Domino Revival, as he talks about in the film. He also has featured Isaiah Saldivar, Alexander Pagani, um, Greg Locke, he has Ryan Lestrange, he has Jenny Weaver, he has um, I'm trying to, Vlad Savchuk. So there's numerous people that are featured within this film. And a lot of it, most of it, I would say a good chunk of it, was featuring and talking about themselves and talking about uh, their growth into ministry and their platforms on social media and their followings and the things that they were doing and what revival was and what it looked like and miracle signs and wonders and deliverance and people uh, persecuting them and the the different there's different elements that they talked about uh, there's some elements I would agree with such as uh, the concerns surrounding people that are dealing with depression anxiety suicide uh, matters like that there are some things that we probably would agree with as far as um, so, uh, social um, issues and um, cultural issues that we would have concerns about. The concern I have personally surrounding this film, and I told Dave this, um, that there's a call for revival, and um, I think this matters to talk about. And the reason being is because of who is in this film. And I think that you watching need to be aware of what's going on here because there's a call for unity. There's a call for unity among denominations, even though at the same time they'll say denominationalism is dead. Um, Signorelli said that the other night in Times Square. I watched that video. I've, we have both watched hours upon hours of these videos to prepare for this. Uh, what you need to be aware of is what this unity looks like. 
And so the unity in this film is centered around individuals that believe themselves to be apostles and prophets. Um, Jeremiah Johnson is another one. He is a, uh, acknowledged as a prophet. Um, Ryan and Jenny both acknowledge themselves. Alexander Pagani acknowledges himself as an apostle. And when I say apostle, I do not mean church planter. Uh, these are things that I would affiliate with the New Apostolic Reformation because of the belief that apostles are affirmed as having governmental authority within the church, that they're needed today and they're being restored, as well as prophets. So I think that you need to be aware of that because um, I personally can't unite around something like that. I came out of that movement and I cannot I cannot join arms with someone that's that's saying such things and wanting to take down the mountains of influence or to take the entertainment mountain. That's part of the seven mountain mandate. They mention that at some point in their conversations outside the film. So with that, we wanted to play the trailer um, and to help you to see what they show this is about. And again, just just remember as we're going along um, that we're expressing these concerns because of the undertone of the New Apostolic Reformation, though they would not claim to be part of that. Uh, there's still that undertone that you're you're aligning and, and uh, coming in agreement with those that believe to be apostles and prophets with governmental authority within the church. So. Let's go ahead, uh, if you're okay, Dave, and let's go ahead and play the trailer, and then we'll go from there and talk about some of the things that were said by Mike Signorelli and others during, uh, before this film, the making of it, and then after. The Bible isn't the story of what happened. It's the story of what always happens. Society is attempting to redefine right and wrong. God's people are being faced with the decision. Do I bow in fear or stand for truth? It might look like it's dark. It might look like it's impossible. But I say I serve a God who deals in the impossible. Nothing is too hard for him. At his words, demons tremble. The pastors already think I'm crazy, so I don't have anything to prove to anyone anymore. The doctors told you you'd always be on medication. The surgeons told you there's no procedure. You need a physical healing in your body, but I want to give you the healer, not just the healer. This is about the gospel. The reality of God should change everything about our life and the world around us. There were moments where I would cry, and I'd say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? The power went off, and about seven people ran forward with knives. When I was making all these TikTok videos, and no one had any idea that I almost lost my life. I thought this is legit. Is it legit? What are we gonna even do? Our nation and the nations are in revival right now, and what we do is really important. We can like quench this thing out really quickly. I'm putting on the boxing gloves, and I'm going out and going to war against every unclean spirit. Devil, you might have power, but I've been given all power. You are empowered by Jesus Christ. We've worked with close to 5,000 churches. Pastor Mike, you are the fastest growing church in America. God is literally doing something here that we have never seen happen before. God preserves a remnant to bring a revival. We need the glory of the King. I will pay whatever. Because I will not give that which cost me nothing. I want to share with you some of the things leading up to the release of this film uh, from October 24th. So there was um, several several videos that came out. There was a Zoom call that was done with most of those that attended and participated in the film. And just to give you some some highlights of what was said in that there were things said such as before the film was released that there were prophetic words given by several individuals that were part of it some of the things said were it is what the lord is doing in this generation um there another was saying that mantles were going to be released during the filming of this or sorry during the release of this film uh, that the lord is going to weave people into the story 
uh, there was a statement made that fire was going to erupt. And when I say fire, I don't mean physical fire. I don't mean uh, that the firefighters will be called to, to quench and, and to put out fires, but the fire of God would, would erupt. Uh, that people will trace the heritage of the birth of their ministry to this film. That was an interesting, interesting statement. Uh, there was even mention of packing water bottles to baptize people in the theaters. In the theaters. It was prophesied that the Elijahs would find this to be a lifeline and that Jezebel will be dismantled. Uh, another talked about the importance of worship and how God's power would be released through songs and the chemistry of people is going to change in the presence of God. Uh, I, I can't help but to hear the certain words in this because of someone that was in this movement. I recognize some of this stuff. There is a significance um, in this type of movement on the worship, the power of the sound. There's, there's always this talk of the sound, a new sound being released, a new sound to unlock the presence and the anointing of God, a new sound to um, help to uh, prepare the, the atmosphere for the man or woman of God so they can release the anointing. So worship is a big key in the part of this movement. Um, talking about the fire and the mantles being released, and that's going back to uh, the Generals of the Faith, which we will touch on that. Uh, I did take one clip from the film when I was in there that I found very interesting, and, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I was not able to capture the whole thing, but we'll talk a little bit about that. But mantles being released, that's a reference to past generals of the faith, those that, that are held in high esteem, that we want to emulate their ministries, and we want to capture what they did and their impartation. Um, Another talked about the um, that 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 they said Halloween was going to be canceled for 2023. I don't know about you, Dave, and I don't celebrate Halloween, but I don't know about you. But uh, the last time I checked, Halloween was not canceled <laughs> for 2023. Amen. So, do you have any thoughts as far as that video you wanted to share? Yeah, a lot. Well, you you earlier you were talking about the uh, how they want to have unity. And, and what we would call that is the economical, it's known as the economical movement, having yeah. unity, what it is, is unity at the expense of truth. Right. So when people say we're going to all unify across all these de different denominations or whatever, that is something that should your red flag, the red flag, if we had a red flag emoji and we could throw it up here, uh, you, you, your red flag should already be going now. Now. In, in contrast to that, we can unify as Christians around essential doctrines that relate to the gospel, like the deity of Christ, the, the death of Jesus in our place and for our sin, and he is buried and rose again, the intercessory ministry, the mediatorial ministry, the second coming, the trinity, the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture, uh, just to name a few. Those are essentials. We can unite with people who agree with it. We can even unite with fellow Christians on matters related to social issues, like on, a, for example, uh, abortion. But unity at the expense of truth is zero unity. That that wasn't what Jesus was praying for in in John seventeen. Unity at the expense of truth. He's that's why he said. You know, sanctify. You know, sanctify us in your word. Your word is truth. So truth matters in order to have unity. Um, and and so that. But there's this there's, there's this doctrinal minimalism that says just unify across denominations so that we can become one. And that wasn't what Jesus wanted. That that's the problem with the economical movement. That's the problem with them uh, suggesting that we can just unite at, uh, on the basis of, of that's the problem with uniting without the basis of truth, um, because you have to have truth in order to bring unity, and the unity is to be expressed because of our unity in the word, and because of the word, and because of what the church has taught, not because of a movement in which they say that the Lord is at work. We're gonna we're gonna put that. I notice how I said that. I said that very intentionally. We're gonna put a pin in that because towards the end, um, I'm gonna talk a lot about revival. So, but just notice that they they they're saying that this is a move of god this is a move of god god is moving it's all about and it's all about um if you watch the videos not the not the trailer but if you watch the the announcement video if you watch the other videos and on and on it's always about my experience 
It's right. not about, let's say, hey, you know, Don, I'm going through this situation and the Lord is at work in this through it. Like I could say a number of things. The Lord, here's the things that I'm going through. But then what is the Lord doing through that? The, to be encouraging to edify another Christian per Ephesians 4.29 and Ephesians 4.15, we don't point to ourselves and say, hey, this is what my experience is. We say we can share our experience, but our experience is always subjected to the word of God. And so I can say the Lord is at work. In, I can share the situation, and I can share that the Lord is at work. He's using this suffering in my life in, in a profound way to help me to grow to be more like Christ. And what you notice in these videos, these guys are pastors, okay? So I have a higher standard for a pastor. These guys, they point to themselves. When you, when you don't talk about Christ as the, you, you can share your testimony, as I said, you can share your experience, but it's not about you. If all you do is talk about, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and, and I have this thing to say and this word to say, um, people start to get a little nervous and they start to wonder, okay, but where's that in the Bible? Uh, how are you growing in the word? And, and they love, I just want to say, they love to say, I'm humble. You know, I'm learning, I'm growing, which, which is so, you know, authenticity is the word of the day. You know, it's the flavor of the day. And so people are compelled and, and drawn towards their authenticity and humility. But the, we ha I have to say this. What they're doing is not real biblical authenticity, and it is not real biblical humility. Because, it, again, it doesn't often, biblical authenticity doesn't point to me. It points away from me. It's interested, as Paul said in Philippians 2, in the interest of others to serve them. Uh, biblical humility isn't about pointing to myself and building my own self up. You know, they, they constantly say, smash the like, smash the like, subscribe, you know, right. this, this pointing to self, this sharing of testimony, this, this propensity I, I've got, oh, just say whatever you want to say. Well, what about self as, as I'm listening to this, where's the, where's the self-control? Where's the fruit of the spirit? Um, there's so many red flags and, and we're only getting started, but those are some things as if you go and you watch the, the, the videos related to this, just start asking yourself, you know, I'm not suggesting you do, but if you do ask yourself as you, as you watch that, notice how they talk. A, a real pastor will do this. Say I was preaching on contentment. You know, I've struggled with contentment in my life. Um, and the Lord has helped me in this way and through this situation um, to not just say that, but to I get, help the audience to understand that this person before them, their shepherd at, at, in this sermon, is trying to help them understand, hey, he understands my struggle. He understands my what I've gone through. And that's, that's the opposite of what these guys are doing. They're just putting up their experiences and, and on the live streams over and over again, you just see this over and over and over again. It's all about experience. It's all about testimony. It's not about the Bible. It's not about the work of Christ. It's not about the work that God is accomplishing in and through us. And, and that is just, that it to me of all of these things is the most tragic thing as, as a Christian ministry leader. If you have a pastor who's pointing to themselves, why are you with that pastor? How are you going to be shepherded? How are you going to be cared for? Or, or, or if you go to them, what's going to happen? Is it, is it what's going to happen? It, it, are they going to actually listen and care about you? Or are they going to bring in their own story and make it all about them? And, and you have to ask that question because over and over again, it's just about their story. And other, they do share other people's story, but they use that to illustrate how their what they've said is is making an impact in people not not what christ has done and and that just it really bothered me don yeah when i was watching the film that was something that really um concerned me and and so listening to to the experiences um you know as much as i appreciate hearing someone's testimony and 
I've had people reach out to me when I've shared my testimony. Uh, that's great. We can encourage one another, as you said. But my testimony is not the gospel. My testimony doesn't save people. I mean, I can tell about what God's done in my life, but if I leave someone and I don't share the gospel with them, then all I've done is tell them about myself. I haven't led, I haven't led them to the direction of saying, no, this is my savior. This is why I can share this testimony. It has to be, go back to the gospel. And the other thing too, when I was watching this film, one of the things I wanted to take note of was how was the gospel presented? And we're gonna get to that too. And I, I noticed in the, even in the trailer, there was a mention of, it seemed that signs and wonders are tied to the gospel. And I've heard some of these people say in their other, in other videos, if you don't believe that signs and wonders in signs and wonders today, or if you don't have signs and wonders accompanying your ministry, then you're not ministering the gospel. That's adding to the gospel. Signs and wonders are not required in order for you to preach Christ and him crucified. If Christ rising from the dead is not the pinnacle of the miracle that is sufficient for you to understand and based on scripture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the atonement for your sins and to cleanse you from unrighteousness and to call you to repentance and saving faith in Christ, if that gospel is not enough as Romans 1.16 says it is, then you're looking for another gospel. You're looking for something more. And, and that's, that's a huge warning in scripture. We are not to do that. Um, so I wanted to mention that. And I know that um, there was a, another video that we watched following the film. So the film was released October 24th. The following day, Mike Signorelli released a video and he released one prior to that too, uh, two weeks, I think, before the video was aired. Again, we watched, I'm, I'm just reiterating this because people are gonna get upset and say, well, how can you judge this if you've never seen it? I personally went and saw the film. I sat and I took notes in a dark theater and made sure that I was um, catching things. And I took the audio and I listened to it again. Dave listened to it. We listened to several videos and watched them and took notes on what they said before the film and after the film. So we're trying to present these things in due diligence. So I just want to say that up front. Just to and clarify, it was not in my city. So the nearest showing was over an hour away and I wasn't going to drive an hour away to go see this so I, I just want people to know that she D don recorded this so that i could watch it so that i could fairly represent it as well okay and and i watched the same things that don watched we watched together we took notes and it was like i think it was in addition to the recording we ended up watching three videos so this episode could be hours and hours long you yeah. know uh it could be so long you know, this film is going to be released a second time, uh, just real briefly, on November 13th. He said in multiple clips that he's going to turn this into a tabernacle. So we're going to look at a clip, uh, a, a clip of partial deliverance and partial healing now. It, we are not done yet. We, Matter of fact, if I know anything about the devil, and I'm speaking as a general right now, if I know anything about the devil, the counterattack is coming. If I know anything about the devil, the enemy is going to start plotting and planning. He's already been doing it. And so we need to rise up right now, and we need to say, devil, we're just getting started in this fight. Last night was, a, was an initiation. It was the beginning, not the end, okay? And so here's the thing. People got partial deliverance they're coming back on the 13th to get full deliverance people got partially healed or they didn't get healed they're coming back the 13th to get healed we got to have that mindset about us because right now that's what he said he we, they needed ongoing deliverance so the come out in jesus name as don said on that episode um what was not enough it, it's it's you know the mass deliverance instead they need to have another mass deliverance and they now want to have this this movie to spark a revival which we've already said we're going to talk about that later but the thing is is notice that that you need ongoing deliverance because even the first time that you would have watched it wasn't enough so you need to come back he said his own words by the way fairly representing him so that you can get deliverance okay so question um mike is a pastor right Pastors are commanded in Acts uh, 20 to preach the whole counsel of God. Uh, in, in, in Timothy, uh, he, Timothy instructs Paul 
to preach the word. He is a pastor. A pastor is bi- to be biblically qualified according to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Both places tell us that they are to teach what? They're to be able to teach. Okay, so we're clear. Now, he claims that he is a gospel minister. He is preaching to people. He is aiming to shepherd them. But the thing is, is if you do you say that they need ongoing deliverance, they need a movie, then why would anybody come to your church service, Mike? Why would anybody come to your service when they could go to a movie? So you're discouraging you're discouraging people from the primary place of ministry, which is in the local church, not in a movie theater. And you you're you're suggesting that 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 theaters can be turned into tabernacles and this will happen all over the play all over the all over the country and even later uh he, he talks about at the end of this this movie how people are going to come and and experience you know salvation and and all this you know through his presentation of the gospel more on that later but it's 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 just shocking that to me that a gospel supposed gospel minister would ever say to people on a YouTube video that that go to a movie and you're gonna get you're gonna get not you're not already gonna be delivered because you went to this movie. Big problem with that, big red flag with that. But then then you're gonna get delivered again because you didn't already get delivered. And this is this is why we speak out against this because it's a total denial of the sufficiency of God's word as as Peter says in 2 Peter 1 3 that scripture is for our life and godliness and then by the way he goes on amazingly uh the Bible he talks about Peter does in that chapter he goes on to talk about the character traits that are to be a Christian and he tells them uh, Peter does his audience to supplement your faith with all these different virtues things that the spirit is producing in the life of the Christian and he's undermining that by saying not that we need to repent but that we need ongoing deliverance and that's why we keep speaking out against this because the influence is astronomical it's almost it's almost unbelievable um you know it's like 800 these guys have 800,000 plus followers on YouTube and a massive amount of followers on social media. It's unbelievable. Basically. And, and you know, it's so, it's so tragic, Don, because, you know, we have problems, you know, Satan, Satan, what he wants to do in the garden, he's so clever. He's so crafty. He, he, he gave at the very opening in Genesis three, he, he, he seemingly sounded, it sounded good. And what, that's what these guys do they say things that sound good at the beginning but then you have to pay attention to everything else that they're saying and and we have to be so clear about that today because somebody could say 70 percent of thing a thing that's good and then the rest of what they're saying isn't any good and so we have to be we have to be really clear biblically we have to be really clear theologically and we have to explain why these things matter and and so this is a total denial of the sufficiency of God's word and the sufficiency of Christ as we see in the scripture. So thoughts on that. Yeah, I would agree. And and listening to him say that about, well, someone got partial deliverance and partial healing at the film. So now they're gonna wait. <laughs> they're gonna wait from October twenty fourth until November thirteenth to get full deliverance and full healing. First of all, you were talking about a pat. I can't imagine a minister saying to someone, "Oh, knowing you think you you know that they have indwelling demons," and you're telling them <clears throat> you got partially delivered. So just wait a few more weeks, and then you can go to this film, and then you can get fully delivered or fully healed. Second of all, we don't see that in scripture. That has to be the final authority, and I'm going to be a thorn in the side for them but what they're stating does not match the the scripture they keep saying go back to the book of acts go back to the gospels we are supposed to do greater works than jesus well you're not doing greater works because you're doing you're saying you're doing partial deliverance even though you just said in the trailer 
And I'm sorry, I'm going to get fired up a little bit on this today. And we go, talked about it yesterday. It. it really upset me. But you're going to sit there on a trailer and or preach and scream at people and say, well, we have all power. Well, it doesn't look like you have all power, sir. Because you're sitting there and you're telling, another one's telling, well, you can get partial delivered. You got partially delivered. I've also heard Mike Signorelli on, on um, a video recently say, well, the reason why people don't get um, f uh, fully delivered and they only get partial deliverance and then they go and complain because they went to Saldivar's meeting or so-and-so's meeting and they only got partial deliverance is because they partially repented. How dare you say something like that to someone? And then you want to go on to say, well, we're not the problem. You are. That's what faith healers have been doing for decades. They've been telling people, it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith and you didn't do what the man of God told you to do. And it's your fault. Instead of saying, I'm not hearing from God. I'm a false prophet or I'm a fake faith healer. I'm not doing the same things Jesus did because Jesus didn't do partial deliverance. He didn't do partial healing. Neither did the apostles because they were given the authority and the power by Christ himself who has all authority. We don't have all authority. We are under authority. There is a huge difference. Jesus said in Matthew 28 that all power and authority was given to him on earth and in heaven. He didn't say it was given to the apostles. He delegated them to have a, the authority to go and to authenticate that they were coming with the message of Jesus Christ, who is the true Messiah. And there is no partial deliverance in the scriptures. There is no partial healing when the apostles and above all, when Jesus Christ ministered. So this is a lesser power. I thought we were in a new covenant. <laughs> why is this looking i mean i'm not the only one to say this why is this looking worse prophecy looks worse healings look worse deliverance looks worse you're you're telling people this and then you're gonna say well we've been given all power and and then to tell people just wait a few weeks purchase a movie ticket and go get your full healing i i just think that is wicked to a, to a certain degree. I think that is wicked and I think it's unbiblical and I think that it's really doing a disservice to people because people are not hearing the truth according to scripture. Amen. And, and I'm sorry for getting upset. Um, you don't need but, to apologize for that. But I, I, when I listened to this and I sat and listened to this and, I've, and we listened to, this, to these videos and these things for hours on end and taking all this in and trying to process it, it's grieving to me. Do you know how many people, I, I, this is something to consider. How many people sat in those movie theaters? Let me just say this. The movie theater I, was, I was in was small and it was not even close to being full. How many people came to those movie theaters did not hear a clear presentation of the gospel, even though he said he was going to give an unapologetic, brutal presentation of the gospel. How many people sat in that theater, thought that they accepted Christ and, and, and gave their full surrender and gave their yes, thinking that's the gospel, <laughs> and have now been deceived and essentially on their way to hell because they haven't heard the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is grieving to think about. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that because um, th that's something I, I would like for those that would watch this that may be in opposition to consider. Is what they're doing really lining up with scripture? Is what they're doing really greater works than Jesus did? Or is that what John 14, uh, 12 even means? Um, those are things you need to think about. You really need to think about that um, and to consider just because you felt something, even if you went to the theater, if you felt something in the theater or you had some manifestation or you had an experience, your experience is not the final authority. Scripture is the final authority. The word of God is sufficient for you to understand the truth. Yeah, it doesn't tell you how to bake a cake, and it doesn't how to tell you to find your spouse. And it's not going to give you all the little answers to life, but it is going to guide you in your life to tell you how to conduct yourself, the ways to walk, how to please God, how to um, to avoid temptation, to be led by the Spirit. It's going to tell you everything you need. It is sufficient for that. And with that, <laughs> um, I will get into the the clips um, as we talk about with the movie now. 
Um, just to give you, I'm going to summarize a lot of, of lot of what was stated in this film. And so um, it opens with a monologue of darkness versus evil. Mike Signorelli starts and it was a monologue and it's showing different clips of him in New York looking out um, on the water. And so he's talking about the darkness increasing. We would agree on that. The darkness is increasing. Evil is intensifying. Um, the, the days seem to be getting darker, but there is hope because of Christ, because the light outshines the darkness because of Christ. But what I did notice um, is that there was a, a, a dichotomy made, I guess, if you will, that he talked about the darkness and the evil was rising. But then he said, but then, but a, but a remnant is rising. So where is God in that? is my question. And I'm sure that he would acknowledge God in that, but it just seemed that there was this, um, the antithesis was darkness and evil and the remnant. <laughs> I, I just noticed that that's a small observation. Um, they each, so everybody that's in this, um, they each share their stories. That's the gist of this documentary. It's them sharing their stories. They, they're saying that they're sharing verified miracles. They're sharing deliverances. They're sharing, um, their their personal testimonies of their ministry, how they came into ministry. Um, so some of the ones that share, Mike Signorelli, Vlad Savchuk, Isaiah Saldivar, Jenny Weaver, Greg Locke, Ryan Lestrange, Alexander Pagani, Jeremiah Johnson. Those are some of the, the names that many people will know. There were several other people in there. I know Mark Driscoll was mentioned in there as well. Several other people I was not familiar with. Um, there was a couple of uh, the Greens, I think, that they were affiliated with the Huntington Beach Revival in 2020. So a lot of these people are sharing their personal experiences, their own ministry, how their influence grew. They talk a lot about numbers in, in this film, about how their influence grew and their platforms grew, just and their videos that went viral and their TikToks that went, that went viral. Um, they talk about, um, they're stating that people are giving their lives to Jesus through their viral videos during the pandemic and through their ministries and claiming revivals are taking place. Um, Signorelli shares about how he was reading through the Bible at age 14, uh, looking for answers, and he came to Acts 2 with Peter. So this is one of the examples that I want to share with you. This was early on in the film. And he wonders why God would use Peter. So, and, and he's shared this in other interviews too. I've heard him say this on at least two other occasions outside this film. He's probably said it more than that, but at least two other occasions, I heard videos, him talking about this testimony. And it's the same thing. He's, he's sitting on his bed, looking for answers in the Bible. He'd been reading the Bible. This was the fourth time of him reading it through. And he begins to understand when he comes to Acts 2 about Peter, wondering why would God use Peter? He begins to understand how God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it's in this moment that he says he understands the gospel. Now, I I don't understand what he means by that. And I don't want to draw conclusions from that, but I don't understand what he means by the gospel when he says, I understood, it seemed like that he said, I understood that God would use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise by using Peter. And then he prays to God to use him as he did Peter. So, he mentions the word gospel. The word gospel is mentioned several times in the film, but I did not hear a clear presentation of it. I had Dave double check me because I didn't want to misrepresent someone. I did not hear a clear presentation of the gospel. I heard the word gospel, but not a clear presentation. Um, he was, he said he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and he had a personal Pentecost in his bedroom at age 14. Uh, the question I had is, um, you know, Dave brought up about the movie Come Out in Jesus Name that, that came out. Or this year. And my question was, did the same people come for deliverance that went to that film? I mean, I think that's a, that's a valid question to ask and to consider because um, I've seen, again, I've seen them talk about how, you know, people only get partially delivered. It's not their fault. They do everything that they can do and they're following God. So it's, it's on that other person <laughs> because they didn't, um, you know, they didn't partially, they only partially repented. And it may be because they're hearing a partial gospel. I mean, that may be something to consider too, um, because we don't see that in scripture as far as someone that partially got saved or partially got, uh, or partially repented. Um, we just don't see that either people, other people repented and they, that had broken in contrition before God. And they had a transformation that only God could do of turning their heart of stone to a heart of flesh and, tr and transforming them for his glory, or they disobeyed God and did their own thing. 
Um, so that's a question I have. I, I, I have a, I've, I just have a real issue with, with saying, <laughs> saying things like that. I've also seen videos. I, I find it ironic and sad that for all their talk that they have over authority uh, over demons, um, that we're seeing these deliver the, the people, the demon slayers go into each other's churches and cast demons um, out of their own congregations. And this is happening over and over and over again. And I just want to say this with love. If, if you're listening and you're part of one of these congregations, you need to pay attention to that. There's not freedom in that. There, there's no freedom when you continue as a born again believer to say, I can still have demons that enter me at, at, because of things that I do. What Christ did is sufficient to deliver you. He is the deliverer. And that's what salvation is, is deliverance. Does that mean that you're not going to sin? No, it doesn't. That's where sanctification comes in and you understanding what progressive sanctification is. There's positional sanctification, which is justification. And that is one point in time when Christ d delivers you from the penalty of sin. And then progressive sanctification is where you realize you are delivered from the power of sin because of Christ. And it is a daily walk. It is a daily dying to your flesh. It's a daily death to dying to, to, to realizing that God will provide the way out of escape when you're tempted, that you are going to, you are going to sin. And it's not a demon that's causing you to do it. There's three enemies we face in this world, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Scripture talks about this. Ephesians 2 talks about it. Ephesians 2 and 3. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Not everything is a demon. But we need you need to understand that. And you need to acknowledge, why am I in a church that they're saying that they're deliverance ministers and they're demon slayers, but the congregation continues to need deliverance done? I mean, Dave's seen it on these videos. I've seen it. It's it's You can't ignore it. So that needs to be addressed. Um, there is a discussion of the demonic in this film. They touch on different areas. A statement is made that you can be a, a Christian and still be in chains. So, and people are bringing things to the altar. Um, they're encouraged to bring things to the altar. They're encouraged to do something to show that they've repented enough, I guess. So with that, there was a clip we wanted to play. This was something that um, Signorelli uh, posted on his YouTube channel a couple weeks before the film um, was released. And we wanted to share this clip with you and offer some thoughts on it. In addition to the world we see, there's a world we don't see. There is a world in which there are spiritual forces at work, God and angels, Satan and demons, and that they are at work in our world. The world we live in is impacted by forces that are invisible but powerful. We see right now, obviously, darkness everywhere and genders trying to get into our children, into our kids. The After School Saiyan Club met for the first time here at Holmes Elementary. The After School program is popping up around the nation. They are seeking to bring about division, anger, depression, suicide. Nearly one out of every three American adults reported having symptoms of anxiety or depression this summer. And if you just lay that storyline over our world, it's the only thing that really makes sense. Sin is an illegitimate attempt to meet a legitimate need. And so when I look at culture, I see culture trying to meet legitimate needs, the need to be loved, the need to be accepted. I see them meeting those needs illegitimately through sex, through drugs. And so my diagnosis of our culture today is they're on the pursuit to be loved, to be known, but they're going through the wrong channels. That evolutionary myth that we're good and getting better and with technology, education and progress, things will improve has proven to be completely the opposite of reality. If anything, we're bad and getting worse and all of the technological progress doesn't lead to moral and mental progress. The rates of suicide, self-harm, anxiety, and depression are up among adolescents. If you look at the world in which we live and you just ask the question, is there an enemy? And if so, what is he doing? Then you unlock this new reality of explaining what's going on in the seen realm, really begins in the unseen realm, and then impacts and affects where we live. The scripture makes it very clear that when darkness covers the earth in Isaiah 60, that the glory of the Lord shall rise. So it is a setup more than what it is a downpool. And the church is maybe looking at it a fearsome way, but for the glory of the Lord to come in, it requires darkness. God requires darkness 
to bring forth light. And so as you read the Bible, you hear about demons and spirits and powers and principalities. And some of them have names like Baal and Astra and Chemosh. And as you study them in the Bible, you realize that the things that they were encouraging and doing in ancient days are things that are happening in present days. New days, but old demons. When you hear the taunts of Goliath, you will see a David emerge. When there is a global famine, there will be a Joseph that had been going through a process and God was getting ready to debut him. Because God always has a plan when humanity has ran out of plans. Guys, this has truly been a digital revival. Right there in your living rooms, God has done so many amazing things. My inbox is flooded with reports of medically verifiable miracles, marriages being restored, whole families accepting Christ and now going on a journey of being discipled, but I see a shift. It's time to leave the living room. It's time for us to gather together. I, I saw dominoes dropping. Each domino represents another life, another yes, another city, town, and region saying yes to Jesus. And so that's why I'm announcing the domino revival. Um, I've been in ministry now for 23 years. I have served in a variety of ways in the local church. Um, in addition to working full time for the majority of that time at Servants Grace. Over, over that period, both ministering online and offline, I have talked to and counseled many people that are suicidal. They are depressed. They are anxious. And they have real personal struggles, like is mentioned here. But what I want to say is this, is the appeal here in this clip is purely emotional it is it is pulling at your heartstrings to get you to agree with their argument and now i'm sympathetic i'm sympathetic to those who are struggling with suicide i'm, I'm sympathetic i care about people who are struggling i i can't tell you how many times i've had to call the police because somebody when somebody tells me that they're going to commit suicide i am required to call the police i'm required to report so stating that equating what they're doing with the hurting and the struggling person how dare they how dare they pull at the heartstrings of people and use the real hurts of real people like they're doing there's nothing godly about that at all that the people that are suffering from suicide and and our teens are and adults are because you know what life is really hard and and it just boggles the mind but but that's not even the most concerning thing because jeremiah johnson says he talks about sin sin isn't what jeremiah says sin is missing the mark missing the aim violating the law of god transgression going and crossing a boundary that god has established that's what sin is and there's no mention of that there's zero mention of christ there's there's the mention by driscoll of old demon new days which sounds good is it true is, is there an old demon for a new day? Where, where, where is that in the Bible? It's a, it, this is all called equivocation. It's called equivocation. It's called, let's make, let's, let's make an appeal based on some semblance of truth to people, and then they'll, they'll be emotionally drawn, like, we, like I talked about earlier, through their authenticity, through their humility. And that's all this is about. It's all about my, my testimony, my story, my, my thinking, what I think is superimposing my meaning over the passage. You know, it's, it's very, it can be very convincing for people who, who are biblically illiterate. And biblically illiteracy, that is the problem with this movement, is people don't know key facts and key ideas and the meaning of things. And with these people, with these guys, they use words and they make it sound so convincing because they're so passionate, but they don't know what the words mean and they don't know how to apply And even more importantly, they don't know how to apply them to the lives of people. And we've seen that over and over again. And so they can have their authenticity and humility and they can have their passion, 
But when those three things happen, apart from truth, you have a disaster. You have a train wreck. You have people being drawn into a movement that is, as we'll talk about later, it's not of God. It, it emanates. It's, Satan is all about emotions divorced from the word. What God is interested in, and there's a whole book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is all about this. The book of Psalms is written so that we would have our emotions regulated by the Bible. It's not, first and foremost, my experience. It's, it's God's word. God's word is the final arbiter for truth. And that's the, that's the central problem with what we call theological liberalism. Many of you would know it as progressive Christianity. It places experience and, and, and scripture at the same level. And that is always a recipe for disaster. It has always caused problems. And it's exactly what we see in this movement. It's exactly why people are, oh my gosh, this, this story is so captivating because we, we, we are all made to love stories. God wrote a story and he gave it to us in a book. And that, that book, the word of God, has one unified story um, o- over which from Genesis to Revelation is centered on the person of Christ. And so we are naturally drawn to stories. We are naturally drawn um, to captivating leaders. We're naturally drawn to authenticity and to humility and, and those things. But you have to be careful because these guys, they don't want your best. They don't even know what they're talking about. They don't. Yeah, one of the, the things that, um, that I noticed, too, watching this film um, the comments that were made during the film. And uh, there were a couple of them I, I took note of that were kind of, that were disturbing and I would think discouraging to people. Um, someone said, uh, you know, when they meet someone that believes in God, but there's nothing supernatural happening in a person's life, then they're, they're disturbed by that. And there is this focus, as you were saying, on the experiences and you being able to tell stories. Um, the, the leader that I was under who's in this film, he, he loves to tell stories about himself and, but he's not, he's not exclusive. He, he's not operating exclusively in that. That's a pattern that you will hear a lot of stories, personal stories and personal accounts and exploits from a lot of these people as they stand up because they give credence to those. They believe that they have, um, weight to them. So that's why they tell them. And again, it's a false humility. It's it's puffing yourself up. It's telling all about you instead of the uh, really glorifying Christ, essentially. But that was said, you know, that it's disturbing if if someone says they believe in believe in God, but they don't have any supernatural things that they can say about their life. That that's that's a problem. Um, one of the things that stood out to me in this film, and I just I kept replaying it over and over again because it it. Again, it was sitting in there. I was thinking, how many people are hearing this? And then they're measuring themselves up to what this person just said and thinking, well, I'm, I must not be a true Christian. There was a comment made saying, if your Christianity is boring, then you're probably not a Christian. And that was verbatim. I wrote it down and I went back and listened again to that individual say this in the film. And I thought, what? So you having a boring mundane what about the what i'm i'm a stay at home mom what about the housewife that's taking care of children changing diapers doing laundry cleaning the house um <clears throat> doing the mundane day to day things that we all do having a job um d- doing running errands and doing the things that we do to take care of things so you're going to tell those of us that stay at home with our children, for example, if we're not seeing, if we're living a boring Christianity and that uh, we're not doing signs and wonders and we're not raising the dead and we're not making limb, uh, making a two inch foot grow out to the same length as the other one or saying that we're doing that and we're claiming these miracles, which that's a whole other thing. People are using the word miracle very loosely these days and ascribing miracle to things that are not miracles when you measure them up to the confines of scripture. But you're going to tell those of us, for example, that stay at home with our children and do the day-to-day things to take care of our children, to serve our husbands, to take care of our homes, that if we have a boring Christianity, then we're not Christian. I don't know where the gospel is in that. That to me is demeaning, it's berating, and frankly, it's unbiblical. 
because I'm not measured by the amount of supernatural manifestations that I can attest to. Yeah. I attest to one, and that's the resurrection of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ out of, an, of a tomb that is now empty, and the death that he paid for my sin on my behalf that I could not pay, that I deserved. I deserved the wrath that came down on him, but in his grace and mercy, God be rich in mercy, sent his son to die on the cross for me. That's all I need <laughs> as far as a miraculous sign. And so I find that very um, disparaging, um, not only to, to that example, but then just in general, there are people that are sitting in those theaters and they're hearing that and they're thinking, well, I, I'm not I'm not going out and I'm not praying enough for people. I'm not sharing the gospel that they're saying is the gospel with other people. I'm not laying hands on people enough. Listen, I lived in that world for years, nearly two decades of my life. I lived in that. And I was one of those people. I, I laid hands on people in Home Depot. I laid hands in, on people in Walmart. I did things. I went out. I was I was doing all the things. And it ended up being a huge hamster wheel that I was on. And I didn't even realize it, that I was on a massive hamster wheel and doing all these things and wearing out. And I've had, and I've had, I can't even tell you the number of women that I've talked to come out of this, Dave, and the same thing that they've said to me, same thing that I didn't realize I was exhausted doing all this spiritual warfare. And they spent a lot of time talking about the demonic in this film. And I acknowledge a demonic exists and Satan exists. We both <laughs> acknowledge that. But again, very little Christ, very no Christ crucified on the cross, very little of that that was mentioned, I'll be fair. But no, no clear presentation of the gospel. But yes, let's talk about Malek and let's talk about Ashtoreth and let's talk about all these other demons and not address sin is what you said um, in the clear biblical sense. Let's not let's not really go on and talk about what Scripture has to say about the gospel. Um, when you have statements like that that are made, it places burdens on people to do these things, or they're really not Christian, and that's what they're gauging their life by what they do instead of what Christ has done. And then revival, and uh, we'll see in Scripture as we go on, is marked um, not by what we do, but it's in the proclamation of God's Word. When true revival took place in Scripture among God's people, it was because the, the Word of God was ministered to them, and they turned back to God, as what that which was is repentance. They turned back to God and away from the things that they were doing, away from the idolatry, away from the 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 sin that they were participating that they and that they loved more than they loved God. So, and that's very different than what I would say is going on in this film is revivalism. And I know Dave's going to talk about this, the distinction. Um, but there's more of an appeal to an emotional response, uh, the number of people who responded, um, and and I would encourage you too, just as a quick thing. Take time to look up some of the research done even under Billy Graham's ministry over the years. There's been research that's been done on that, and they even showed that of the the hundred percent of people that go forth, I think it was what two to three percent actually were found to continue on to be professing Christians and to be in churches. So even the decisional repentance, um, which was the altar call uh, uh, phenomenon, which was started under Charles Finney, um, that. Not that God can't meet someone at an altar call. I won't say that because God is sovereign. Um, but to make a decision for Christ, it's really, again, not presenting the gospel and showing the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. Um, they share testimonies of healings, and I believe God heals. I believe God does miracles according to his will. Um, what I would just say is, again, what is really the biblical definition of a miracle? And are what are these really healings that are taking place, or is there a psychosomatic thing going on? Is there um, uh, different things that could be taking place? Are there true healings that are going on? Um, there's different things to consider with that. the The last thing I wanted to say about this film is that they talk about the generals of the faith, and uh, this is where I I was able to get a shot on my video on my phone, and just to say before we play it real quick. Um, Signorelli says, before this is played, that Christ paid a price. He says, Christ paid the ultimate price. And I'm using his words. 
He said, Christ paid the ultimate price, but it is the people who pay the price and show others that it is possible. They find a way by retracing ancient paths. And then they go on to a little bit later to play this clip, and they're they're um, identifying certain people in the film with past generals of the faith. So the two I didn't catch, the first one was Jenny Weaver. They compared her to Amy Simple McPherson. And then Ryan Lestrange, they compared him to A.A. A. Allen. So we're going to play that just so you can kind of get the gist of what the others look like that they compared themselves to. Revival is when the world is impacted by the knowledge of the glory of God. So when you hear about the generals of faith, and many of us heard that, that have been a part of this movement, or maybe if you're watching and you're still a part of it, there's always a big focus on the generals of faith and propping them up. And I have, and I have great respect for, um, for people that have ministered the gospel in, in the truth, according to the word of God. But I, I don't want to emulate those people and I don't want to, um, put them on a pedestal because at the end of the day, they're fallible people just like just like I am. And if you take time to look at these generals of the faith, and Signorelli views himself as a general. You heard an earlier clip. He says as a general in this thing. Many of these people um, that I had to learn about, um, the, Amy Simple McPherson. I mean, there is scandal that's behind her ministry. Uh, if you take a look at it, A.A. A. Allen. Um, and again, everybody's fallible. But when you have people that are propped up um, in, in this movement, John G. Lake is a big one. I mean, that's one that he is massively revered in this movement. And there are things that we were not, I was not told about John G. Lake. So they'll tell a little bit of things to make them look fallible, but they'll leave out a lot of things that are really bad and really make them uh, that they were con artists essentially, that they took advantage of people. They were not ministering the gospel and they fabricated stories. So um, I think that there's great caution to use in that because uh, they seem to be setting themselves up in the film congruent to those who are viewed as generals in the faith. Um, and I know Dave Wilkerson, I mean, he's he's ministered. Uh, there's some books I've read of his that were really good. Um, I, I just, I really kind of, winced at that one when I saw that I thought you're comparing yourself to Dave Wilkerson um you know I I again it's this whole thing of they kind of think really highly of themselves so they want to prop themselves up on pedestals I don't know if you have thoughts on that Dave no I I agree I agree oh I know we want to talk about the uh briefly about the attack their attack on you know cessationism because it seemed that there was a sore spot hit when the movie cessationist came out and I would encourage you to watch it. I mean, even as a, if you're a confessing charismatic, professing charismatic, you need to watch it. Um, don't give in to the whole uh, propaganda of, well, stay away from that because it's, you know, this, this reason or that reason. You need to watch it. You need to be fair and watch it. I would dare say there are things that you have not been taught that are from a biblical standpoint, and you need to consider those things. And you also need to look into, just as a side note, you need to look into the history of the charismatic uh, movement. Yeah. Just throwing that out there, because there's, yeah. again, there's things that you don't know about that I, I, I can uh, verify I was not taught and told. Um, so there's always holes that are that are um, left that you don't realize are holes. So in, in these all these videos that they produce, they talk about you know, this, they attack the cessationist viewpoint and they, they say that it is heresy. Um, even, even very recently, if you, you, and you can go look at this, there was a debate between Jim Oshman and Michael Brown. And at the very end, one of the hosts of Bible Dingers asked Michael Brown, do you, do you think that you can interpret the Bible through a cessationist viewpoint? And he said no. And then, you know, Jim was asked the opposite question. Do you think that you can view, uh, somebody can interpret the Bible through a continuationist viewpoint? So Don and I thought that it would be good 
to include uh, a very short clip. It's about uh, two minutes, so it's not exactly that short, but we thought that it'd be good for you to listen or watch this clip um, uh, towards the end of this discussion that Michael Brown and Jim Oshman had on Bible Dingers. It was a live stream uh, a few weeks ago. So here is that clip. One final question that we ask all of our guests uh, to kind of conclude the discussion. Uh, Ryan, why don't you ask that question? Yes, and sorry, we're, we're right towards the end here. And sorry, guys in the chat, we aren't going to have time to get to a live stream Q&A today because we only had an hour and a half. And it's still, and it seems like we were just getting started in the conversation, honestly. Um, but uh, Dr. Brown, I'll start with you. Would you say that the cessationist uh, interpretation of the Bible is a possibility? No. Okay. And, and uh, Pastor Osman, I'll, I'll go to you next. Would you say that a continuationist interpretation of the Bible is a possibility? I, I would say the answer to both of those questions depends on your hermeneutical presuppositions. If I approach the scriptures with the same hermeneutical presuppositions as Michael does, I would say, yes, it is a possibility. And if Michael approached the scriptures with the same hermeneutical presuppositions that I did, then he would have to confess that cessationism is a possibility. <clears throat> the difference between us comes back to the way we approach the, the various presuppositions that we bring to the passage when we're looking at it. Because we're not disagreeing over the nature of the passages or the authority of the passages or really who wrote them or the context. We're really, we're really looking at the passages from two different perspectives with different presuppositions. And I, th I think Michael would probably agree with 99% of what I just said. <laughs> Is that true, yeah, Dr. Brown, that. would you? Well, the question is, do I draw my hermeneutical presuppositions from the word or do I impose them on the word? I, so <laughs> I that's what I would say. If, if, again, my, my simple answer okay. is, okay. if you, my simple right, answer, right. if, you lock, answer yeah. if you lock somebody in a room with a Bible, they could read it perfectly in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and they read it a hundred times over for, for 10 years, they would not come out as a cessationist. So, and isn't that, isn't that telling? And Jim's answer, he, he was incredibly gracious and kind, but Michael Brown was not kind. And these guys are not kind. When you say, as Michael Brown did, okay, that you uh, cannot interpret the Bible through a cessation of speed, but he, you, you can't qualify that enough. He, he, will, he will undoubtedly come out in later days and try to explain what he meant by that but the statement stands what you're suggesting to people and what they're hearing is that you can't even be a christian and read the bible if you're a cessationist but the thing is is okay so let's so let's go there for just a minute okay i'm just going to go there for just a minute we're going to move on but cessationists don't minimize the power of god that would mean that we don't believe the bible Okay, it would. We're not minimizing the power of God. The audacity to say that somebody that produced a massive amount of solid, sound theology, like Owen, the Prince of the Puritans, is a heretic then? Error means that you've deviated from what the Bible says. Okay, and there's something to say, a lot to say in Scripture about that. Scripture has a lot to say about that. That's why it tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to rightly handle the word of God. Heresy is not only going outside the bounds of the Bible, it's going outside of what the church has taught. That's why we have the guardrails of the Apostles' Creed and Nicaea and Chalcedon. These men weren't trying to replace or supplant the Bible. They were trying to be faithful and respond to heresies that that were going against what scripture taught okay and that's also why we have confessions today um like this the london baptist 1689 and the westminster confession of faith these are just summaries of what scripture teaches about a variety of topics but to say that being a cessationist is a, it it means that you're a heretic then you're saying that that person that is a cessationist isn't a Christian, and your viewpoint is the only way to be a Christian. Or in Michael Brown's words, if you can't 
read the Bible through a cessationist lens, then you can't be a Christian. Because one of the marks of that, that you have the Spirit is that you have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And not to mention that, if you can't interpret the Bible through a cessationist lens, then guess what? The Holy Spirit isn't going to be able to convict you of your own sin and help you to grow in, in the fruits of the Spirit and in sanctification. Uh, you're not going to be able to hear your pa- – you're not going to be convicted when your pastor's preaching because you don't have the Spirit. Uh, and the pastor is help, trying to help you. By the way, Ephesians 4.15 or Ephesians 4.12, excuse me, is telling us that, that God gave us pastors and teachers that, who are supposed to help us to rightly interpret the Bible. But if you can't read it through a cessationist lens, then you can't even be a Christian. So you're saying that ch- churches and pastors who believe in this are not Christian at all. That's, that's where the argument goes. And, and I undoubtedly, undoubtedly know, having listened to many times with Michael Brown and all these guys, they undoubtedly would push back on everything I just said and said that I was uncharitable. But the, the truth is, what, what he said, what Michael Brown said in that discussion with Jim Oshman was out. It was so outrageous. I know people on both sides of the issue. I have friends on both sides of that issue. You guys that are not hyper charismatic, but they're, they're more towards the middle. They still believe in the sufficiency of scripture, you know, on, on, on their basically soft continuations. And I have friends that are, that are much further down the road on cessationism. I love both of them, but and we're still Christians. I take the authority of Scripture extremely seriously. It is not something to be trifled with at all. But what these guys do isn't that. It's not standing on the Word at all. Um, it's all standing on what I think and what I feel and calling somebody a heretic and using terms that have no meaning, that, that has no meaning. It has... It's not the meaning of the word. Words have meaning. If they don't have meaning and they can be used any way that we want, especially when it comes to theology, then it's no wonder why people get so so confused. And everybody goes and amen, amen, amen. In fact, I just want to I just want to say that you know he takes pot shots. If if you think that this is mind blowing your mind, he in the middle of one of his streams that that Don and I watched. He, he's, he's going on and on and on about he's got quite a bit of rhetoric in this film. This is Signorelli, right? Signorelli, yeah. So, so in the middle, just to prove this point, because I've already used a lot of evidence here, okay? But even in, even in, the, even in one of, the, one of the, the episodes that we watched, they did, talking about the film. Signorelli ta- is, is talking and he's taking pot shots um, rather than engaging in a discussion in a biblical and respectful way. So he's going on and on for a long time, and, and then he's talking about free speech. And then somebody comes into the chat, and they say something against deliverance ministry, and what we're about to see and hear is how these guys respond. But the ironic thing is, to, for both Don and I, is, is that he's talking about the First Amendment. The ability to have free speech. Now, we, we have free speech. That means in America, we can say what we want. But that doesn't mean that we can say whatever we want without respons- being held responsible or, or uh, having somebody respond to us. We, we, have, we have the right to say what we want, but the other person has the right to respond to what we're saying is what I'm saying. Right. And instead of allow it, it's ironic to me that in the midst of this chat about this movie, he's talking about the First Amendment, and then he shuts people down. He, he tells them, uh, the moderator of the chat, to remove that person because they're going against deliverance ministry. So I'll, I'll play that clip, and then, and then uh, Don, uh, you can add whatever you would like. Okay. Free speech under the guise of AI technology did it. This is a fact. And I'm telling you, one of the biggest threats to the body of Christ is going to be AI that they program with bias against free speech. And you're seeing it right here. I can't even post on my own Facebook a picture of the movie poster from this film without their technology. And I'm saying this in air quotes, their technology. It says, we use the same rules around the world for everyone. Yeah, you're right. You eliminate free speech for everybody. So that's fair. 
It's fair if we don't let anybody have religious freedom. And it's the reason why we established the United States, religious freedom and free speech, the First Amendment. Isn't it, isn't it the reason why we have it? And so here's the thing. Uh, somebody block that person in the chat that's speaking out against deliverance ministry. See, the devil's coming out right now. When you unmask the devil, let me just, oh, I feel the fuego right now. Let me just tell you. When you people are like, well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if it's the devil. Let me tell you, there's only two teams. You're either team Jesus or you're team devil. There are 10 virgins, five unwise and five that were wise. Jesus said, you're a, you're either a son of disobedience or you're a son of God. It's you, it's, there is no middle ground. And that's why, and right now we're starting a block party in the chat for everybody who's against the casting out of demons. We're starting a block party and you might be invited to the block party. If you say something stupid in the chat right now, matter of fact, thank you, God, for bringing them out so that we can block them. Because a moving train, look look me in my eyes before we block you. A moving train doesn't stop for barking dogs. This train is rolling. We're gonna cast demons out across America. We're gonna pray for the sick and medically verifiable miracles will happen and we will lift Christ up, not a celebrity, not a celebrity pastor, not an influencer, but the Bible says if Christ be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. This movie is drawing all men unto him because it's about Jesus and this train is moving and it's not stopping for darking, barking dogs in comment sections. Shh, come on. Bye-bye. All right. So let me just show you this because that was my page. Well, um, I watched that clip or I watched the whole video. And when I watched that clip, I rewound it a couple of times to watch it. And I, I'm just going to say this and then I'll move on. Um, first of all, uh, you're right. He's a hypocrite. He's an absolute hypocrite because he just got done talking about free speech, but then he doesn't want to allow someone that disagrees with modern deliverance ministry, free speech. So that's a hypocrite. Um, Signorelli's a hypocrite. I, I'll go on record and say that he is. Amen. He's a he hypocrite. Just, he, just, he just demonstrated it on a video for you all to see, not to mention it's abusive what he did. A pastor does not act like that. I'm sorry, uh, but a pastor does not conduct themselves in such a way. And then to tell someone and to equate them to a barking dog. I, <laughs> um, and then furthermore, um, let, let me just say this too. Um, just because those of us that that are opponents to deliverance ministry, even though some of us used to participate in deliverance ministry, that does not mean that we don't believe in demons, and it doesn't believe that we diminish the power of Christ. What it does mean is that we do not agree with the unbiblical teaching that deliverance ministry is to cast demons out of born-again believers, because it, it undermines the sufficiency of the gospel. It undermines the sufficiency of Christ. It undermines the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit working in the life of a believer. And so him saying things like that, um, he is disparaging people. He's demeaning people. And they don't want to have, that's the, that is a prime example right there, Dave, of not, of shutting down a conversation with someone that you don't, that disagrees with you. They don't want to be challenged. They can't, and other people keep saying, well, why don't you have, the, they're afraid to debate. No, no, no. They're afraid to debate because they don't have any biblical ground to stand on that's solid and sound. And so the, the thing that happens in this movement, it's not isolated to, to Signorelli. They do this, block the haters. You got to block and shut it down. And that's what you do when you create an echo chamber and cult like tendencies in people that you don't want to challenge what's being stated and you don't want to encourage critical thinking. That's how you create a cult. I'm not saying it's what Signorelli has, but that's what, pe what cult leaders do when they are trying to create this bubble where you can't be challenged. You can't challenge the leader because then you start thinking for yourself and then you start comparing things to scripture and then you might leave. Yep. And that that's a dangerous <clears throat> trail to go down. So I, I reject um, th that person that was uh, being called a dog as a moving train doesn't stop for barking dogs. I think that is disparaging. I think it's ridiculous and I think it's immature to do something like that. And if you don't want to, 
you know, if you don't want to be challenged, then maybe you shouldn't, you know, be saying these these things and calling these doctrines uh, in uh, giving them such power if you don't want to be challenged um, on those matters in a biblical way. So I'll move on. Amen. No, I <laughs> I, I I agree a hundred percent. He is a hypocrite. Um, just saying that to be to be clear and that I agree with you. And uh, anybody that shut, you should never shut down. No pastor should ever shut down anybody like that. And, and it's a chat. And, and that's not the only time that we've seen that. Um, so anyways, um, they, they talk about, uh, you know, the gospel. They use this word um, a couple of times, as we've mentioned, but there's no cl- clear presentation um, in the film or in Singarelli's teaching. So let's take a look at that now. You have to be completely surrendered. You can only belong to one kingdom, the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. You cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one and you'll hate the other. And so surrender this happens like Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that says confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that he's the savior and you will be saved. But confession is the first step, not the final. What I actually see is Jesus demanding every idol be broken. Jesus demanding anything you have in reservation, give me 100%. I'm not asking you if you listen to worship songs and read your Bible. I'm asking you, will you surrender everything for once and for all? Jesus didn't say struggle with your sin. He said things like, if you are if you can't stop sinning with your hands, cut it off so that your whole body can actually get to heaven. Jesus said a statement that extreme to help us understand that we are not to play with sin. We are to abandon it and walk the other direction. That is called repentance. And many of you have become good at confessing, but you've never repented. Why do you think we have so many pastors that are falling in the faith? Because we got good at church. We got good at confession, but we never repented. Because in order to step in, you might have to give up some pills that are hiding in your purse right now. You might give up some weed. You might give up some heroin. You might have to give up something. I'm giving you some time to determine if you really want to come into the kingdom or if you just want to be a Christian by title. There is a difference between 99% and 100%. 99% surrendered is 100% disobedience. The Bible says for without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it's not about increasing your understanding. It's about increasing your submission. I'm talking to even ministers and pastors. Your heart has grown cold. Come on, you've become a professional Christian. You've forgotten your first love. I want to get your heart burning hot for him. I want you to return to your first love. Will you break through doubt? Will you break through fear? Will you break through unbelief? I said, will you break through tonight? If you say, Pastor Mike, I want to give everything to the Lamb. I want to surrender everything. Would you just lift your hands with me right now? Wow. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I want everybody to say this with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I thank you for the cross where I was forgiven. Wash me with your blood. I surrender all, every thought, every memory, all trauma. I will follow you all my days. Jesus name. Does somebody shout amen? So we wanted to share that that's in the film. Um, 46 minutes in. Um, to this film, Signorelli says things that you heard just now. So he says you have to be completely surrendered. You can only belong to one kingdom. Um, and he quotes Romans 10, 9 and 10 for surrendering. He says Jesus demands every idol be broken. And he asks, will you surrender once and for all? He says we are to abandon sin and that people that have become good at confessing but not at repenting. He said some people are going to have to give up some things in their pockets and their purses. And he reiterates this statement at the end in the simulcast that that I watched in the in the theater. He says 99% surrender is 100% disobedience. And he gets people to repeat a prayer with him to forgive them of their sins. 
not explaining to them what sin is. And these were clips that this was clipped and edited by his team, not us. So this was all the the montage that he created in that. And he uh, leads people into thanking uh, Jesus for the cross and for the blood of Jesus, focusing on surrendering. Um, in the simulcast, they talk about um, the suicides being canceled, that someone is canceling their own um, plan to do such a thing. And, and they focus on deliverance after that, and many deciding to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And in the simulcast, uh, I'm telling you all this because I want you to, to ask yourself this question. Did you just hear a clear presentation of the gospel? No. <laughs> because I, I didn't. And, and you know, as someone who was part of the movement like this, one of the painful things I had to come to terms with leaving um, is I had to ask myself, could I present the gospel according to what Scripture says? And I couldn't do it. And that's a problem. Um, because telling someone 99% surrender is 100% disobedience, and you're going to have to lay something on the altar basically to prove that you're surrendering. I mean, that's all well and good, but that's works-based. That's leaving. That's that's leading to a works-based gospel, a works-based salvation. And there's all you're you're going to be let down in something like that because it's not going to be based on um, the sufficiency of what Christ did on the cross. You're always going to be measuring yourself up to yourself, essentially, to what you couldn't do. And that's works-based. Um, that's no different than what the Judaizers were really doing in Galatians, that they were at, they were telling the Jews, you don't need this gospel. You know, you need to circumcise yourself and you need to do all these other steps. And then you, you follow the law of Moses and then you will be uh, good enough to be sa- you'll Then you'll be saved. And Paul had to come back and correct that and say, that's another gospel. That's not that's not what Christ saved you from. Who, who's bewitched you? That you, that you believed such things. You need to go back. This is law that these people are telling you. The law doesn't save you. The law is a mirror to show you your need for Christ. So what he's presenting here um, is not the gospel. Um, you know, again, reiterating this full surrender. Will you fully surrender? Will you do this? Will you say yes to God? Will you accept him? Let, let me just let me just say this. <laughs> um, we don't make Christ Lord and Savior. He already is <laughs> Lord and Savior. Amen. So the, the matter is, are you going to um, receive, repent and believe and put your trust that he has fulfilled and, and uh, satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf for your sin, which is rebellion against God, because you and I both, apart, we're lawbreakers. Apart from, apart from Christ, the wrath of God abides. Scripture says the, the wrath of God abides on those who do not trust in Christ, that they're sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2 talks about those that follow the prince of the power of the air. That again, should that, that's a whole other thing to talk about deliverance. Those who follow the prince of the power of the air, those are sons of disobedience. Children of God who have been delivered by Christ are not sons of disobedience. They follow Christ, not perfectly, because they know in this world they're gonna, there's still the presence of sin that we have to contend with, but we have not been left ill-equipped. So, I, you know, I, I know this sounds harsh, but he didn't present the gospel. This is not the, go- <laughs> the gospel. Um, you know, it, would you accept that cr- what Christ did on the cross, will you be washed by his blood? I mean, he's using words that sound right, but this isn't the gospel. You need to ask yourself, where is where is the gospel presented in this? Do I have a clear understanding of the gospel? Um, that's my concern. Is that I left the the theater and I was I was uh, very extremely discouraged and grieved because I thought that's not. I didn't hear a presentation of the gospel. This is not clear. There are people leaving confused and deceived because of what was just said. There's no explanation of sin. There's no explanation of rebelling against God. There's no talk of the wrath of God, why salvation is needed. That's all in Scripture, guys. That's It's all laid out in, in the plan of salvation as to why we need Christ. Um, so those were my thoughts on that. I didn't know if you had anything to add, Dave. No, those are those are really good thoughts. So just one other additional thought is notice how he used the word repentance. 
he talks about repentance as being essentially sorry for your sin. So if you're if you're what we pastors are falling, um, you know, people are struggling. Um, and so it's all repentance in this view, according to him, is all about being sorry. But repentance in the Bible, and it's not even just about changing your mind, which he says with all due fairness. Repentance is not just being sorry or changing your mind. Repentance is being sorry, leading to a change of life because you're turning away from your sin and to a person and to the work of Christ. Right. So it's not just you're sorry for your sin because you've understood that you've missed the mark, you've crossed the boundary of God's law, and you've broken it and you've violated it, um, you've transgressed it. But then you're turning away by by you've seen the horror of your sin and now you've turned away from it and and then not just turned away from it with the help of the spirit but you've turned to jesus as revealed in the word of god and he never talks about that second and that third aspect of repentance and so what he's advocating is what we call false repentance he's preaching in other words a false gospel and and I just want to say something else. As somebody who has preached the Word of God, he is not preaching the Word. He quotes Bible verses, Romans ten nine. He says, you know, be- confess, which Paul says, confess your mouth and believe in your heart, and and that and you'll be saved. Okay, but but he talks about submission. The word submission there is never used in Romans ten, in Romans ten nine through seventeen. You will never see. The, the language of submission. What you see is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And, and we know that God does that work, that Jonah 2.9 says that salvation is of the Lord. And yes, we need to make that decision. Yes, we need to call, as you said, yes, we need to call people to repent and believe. Absolutely, 100%. I'm not, I'm not saying anything otherwise. But we do, we do not submit to Christ as Lord. He is Lord, period. Yeah period it make that makes it about my will and my decision not god's initiative it, god is the one who in salvation took the initiative on on our behalf to pay the penalty that we deserve we deserve and romans 5 tells us that at the right time christ died for the ungodly and just to touch on the this point about sin Every time in Romans 3.23 and 6.23, when Paul talks about all of sin and fallen short of the glory, do you know what he does? He talks about Christ. Where is that in that video? Where, where is the talk about sin and real repentance? And then where is the real talk, like Paul would say, about the person and work of Christ? There, there's no gospel here. There's no hope here. And people, it's, it's all about stirring up people's emotions. And like we've talked about, but um, we've said a lot about that. Let's let's get to the heart of of this matter. Um, you know, this whole movie is based on the premise of what revival, biblical revival, is, and uh, and what it is not. They're claiming that this is a move of God. So so let's talk about that. Is this a move of God? Is God actually being honored? Is God actually using? Uh, this movement. Now, there's a lot to say about this particular uh, conversation. Um, Space prohibits, time prohibits us from going into everything, so I'm just going to focus on mostly on church history. You know, throughout the history of the church, we have seen a great deal of revivals or awakenings, and both terms are used by historians and theologians. Um, It's important, though, to define what we mean. Um, and we need to say that not everything that Christians have called revival is revival in the sense of the term. The term revival and awaking properly refer to the work of the Holy Spirit that cannot be coerced or brought about by emotional manipulation. They cannot be scheduled. You cannot say, hey, I'm going to have revival at that time, and that is revival. True revivals are the sovereign work of God, and he chooses when and how they occur. Now let's talk about some examples of, of awakenings or revival. You know, the, as the gospel spread both east and west to Asia, to Africa, and to the Americas, in, in, our, in our history in North America, if you live in America here or, or on this continent of North America, we've wis- witnessed several awakenings, the most uh, famous of which is the first great awakening, 
which happened, if you don't know, in the 1730s and 1740s. That awakening began in 1734 under the preaching of, of Jonathan Edwards, who is considered uh, the greatest theologian uh, uh, that America has ever produced. That, uh, th that revival began in Northampton, Massachusetts. It spread to towns and, and throughout the New England area. This awakening was spurred on um, in other colonies by preachers such as the Presbyterian Gilbert Tennant, the Pietist Theodorus Frelagian. Uh, Moravian missionaries had an impact on the, uh, that awakening through their most famous convert, John Wesley, and through the impact they had on itinerant preacher, uh, George Whitfield. Uh, George Whitfield uh, preached on both sides of the Atlantic. He traveled from England uh, to Georgia. Keep in mind, this was on ship before there was planes in 1738. But it, his, it was his return to America in 1740 that had a lasting impact. He, and Whitfield traveled from city to city. He was not preaching in he was not preaching in churches. He was preaching out in fields to large crowds. Um, and even Benjamin Franklin, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, he claimed that the positive effects of Whitfield's preaching was obvious in the towns that Whitfield visits. So what we see, though, is there was a even in another revival in the 1840s, this so-called Second Great Awakening, um, led by, as Don mentioned earlier, Charles Finney. But his theology was very different from that of Edwards, whose theology was very Reformed, following the Reformers and the Puritans. Um, the, the theology that Edwards and Whitfield were preaching was Reformed theology. But Finney was an unabashed Pelagian, meaning that he denied original sin. He de denied the substitutionary death of Christ in our place and for our sin, but we call substitutionary atonement. He denied justification by faith alone and Christ alone. That is where we're legally declared forgiven by God. Um, he also invented several manipulative revivalist techniques that continue to be used in revival in many churches today, such as the altar call. Um, and what, but in contrast to this, Edwards wrote down in his works about what revival is. He calls, he took on the tricky task of sorting uh, what place he called the religious affections, as he called them, in the Christian life. And in his works, uh, the works of Jonathan Edwards, uh, point two, uh, 121, he says, there are false affections and there are true. A man's having much affection don't prove that he has any true religion. But if he has no affection, it proves that he has no religion. And so what Edwards is working out here is he's processing in his own words, as he often did, uh, the revival in 1730s and 1740s, this, this period of awakening of people's hearts when many people claim their hearts have been profoundly stirred by God. Uh, Edward's beloved wife, Sarah, had taken, had fallen into this sort of a rapture, feeling herself remarkably, remarkably close to uh, the Lord. And true spirituality was not expressive and swept up, but modest and buttoned down. And this discussion on spiritual ecstasies became a referendum on the revival itself. Now, Edward's in this work, The Religious Affection, he lists 12 negative or inconclusive signs of of conversion, including strong emotions, interesting bodily reactions in an outbreak of religious uh, conversation, 12 positive signs that show that the spirit has truly regenerated the heart unto faith in Christ. Well, in his fourth positive sign, Edwards zeroes in on the way that affections, in his own words, in, in two, uh, uh, point two, uh, 266, he says, arise from the mind's being enlightened rightly in spirituality to understand or apprehend divine things, meaning that they understand the gospel. They understand, you know, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. In other words, what he's talking about is thinking about salvation and the God who commissioned and initiated it and fans the spiritual flame inside of us through the spirit into a flame that that is grounded in a grand vision of God, Edwards is saying, leads to a great way of living. In point two, uh, 298, he says, he that truly sees the divine, that transcendent, the supreme glory of those things which are divine, does as it were know their divinity intuitively. He not only argues that they are divine, but he sees uh, that they are divine. He sees that in 
them wherein divinity chiefly consists for in this glory does mainly consist the true notion of divinity god is god and distinguished from all other beings and exalted above them chiefly by his divine beauty which is infinitely diverse from all other beauty they therefore that see the stamp of this glory in divine things they see divinity in them they see god in them and so um, to be divine now that's what that's what edwards is talking about He's talking about understanding the character of God revealed in the word of God over and against those who would uh, manipulate or schedule revival. Now, his final sign is um, Christian practice or holy life. He's concerned that that the person be walking with God. And, and so he says in, in, in point two four oh six, the chief of all the signs of grace is both as an evidence of the sincerity of professors unto others and also to their own conscience. And so um, he's concerned that the person is by the grace of God and with the help of the Holy Spirit walking in obedience, they're pursuing holiness, they're pursuing service to God, they're actually walking out this walk in obedience and consistent service and perseverance of faith. Um, and, and so um, over and against this idea of that we've been talking today about heightened emotion this this overemphasis on emotionalism and this is this is something that edwards was deeply concerned about in his day it's something that we're seeing um you know happen today where people will schedule a revival or they'll make this type of you know presentation and it'll be all about you know me and mine and my res my temptation and we have to ask um is that what revival is well true revival isn't based on that true revival as we see in like nehemiah 9 the people heard the word in nehemiah 8 uh, from ezra and they turned to the lord they didn't just say hey this is you know what what's being taught to me is 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 i don't agree with it because i don't like it it doesn't make me feel good um, instead what they were taught was the law of god and they were pointed to the word and they were taught the word and and they returned to the lord and uh, they responded to the lord and from that teaching you know with with actual repentance actual sorrow actual change of life and they returned to the lord as joel 2 12 says uh with their whole hearts not just part of their hearts and and we have to ask as you said earlier about what are the signs or is, should we be so fascinated oh the lord moves the lord did this is that what the lord wants and what are the marks of it is is there a holiness of life marked by a genuine change of life a genuine contrition a genuine confession a genuine turning away from our sin into jesus well if there's no marks of obedience and a desire for holiness a desire to serve the lord a desire to worship and honor god um then that's not real revival it's it's just not um and that edwards was very concerned about this because he was a pastor and so he was concerned that the individual be walking in humility um but humility before the lord and so what, what we see in this movie just to summarize and there's so much to say i really have summarized so much what, what, what my point is is that when, when we see revival in church history what we see is people actually turning a being sorry for their sin turning away from it turning to christ why be through the preaching of the word of god that is when the word of god is central in our churches god could bring revival he could he could bring he could awaken people uh, awaken people's eyes but he can't bring revival revival will not happen where christ is not honored where cr the gospel is not preached where christ himself is not presented in in the gospel to people that, that that's where you have a false gospel and that's what we see in the domino revival we see a false gospel we see a false gospel preached in this movement in as we've talked about there's no mention of the sufficiency of christ christ is not sufficient if if christ is not sufficient if we have to have legal give our legal rights to christ then christ is not sufficient to save us he's not sufficient to to convert us he's not sufficient to to justify us he's not sufficient enough to adopt us uh he's not that's then that is sadly what they have to uh the, the main issue here if christ is not sufficient then you have no gospel 
But the truth is, in the Word of God, we have been given the gospel. Praise the Lord. And that gospel is the righteousness of God unto those who believe. And it's not even about whether I believe. It's We don't be, just believe to believe. We believe because God has opened our eyes. He, You see this even in, in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. In fact, <laughs> here's, here's something controversial, in, in, and it's in the text. Jesus closes their eyes from understanding. Right. He closes their eyes. They have no ability to understand. And yet Jesus is still teaching them. And then, in, and then towards the end of the story, he opens their eyes and they understand the things, that, all the things that Jesus is saying and how Jesus himself, Luke 24, uh, Luke 24 tells us, he interpreted all the scriptures concerning himself from where? <gasps> the law and the prophets. So Jesus preached to them the whole Bible and uh, to help us to understand himself from the word. And that's, and that's what revival is all about. It's all about, it all centers on a person, and it all centers on a work. It all centers on uh, preaching the whole gospel, the, the message of biblical repentance, not just you're sorry for your sin, but that you see yourself in light of, of Christ, that you are a lawbreaker in need of the Savior, that you have crossed the boundaries, that you have sinned, and that now now you're, you're sorry for your sin because of that, and you, you desire to turn from it, and you desire to turn from that. But even there, the desire to turn, it comes because God, by the Holy Spirit, is at work in your life. And th that's why they say that we don't have, we, we don't have a good understanding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and that we we are wrong, and that we're heretics, and yet the opposite is actually true. They are promoting a false revival, a false a false gospel, a false message that's not grounded in the Word of God. And so you evaluate. Let me. I'll leave it with you, the listener and and the watcher. You you be a Berean. Acts seventeen eleven tells you this. Yeah. Search the Scripture to see if these things are so. If if what we're saying is wrong then then you have no no reason at all to believe us but if if we're right then you have every reason on scriptural grounds to to test it to do as first thessalonians 5 21 says to test to examine to analyze the argument and if the argument is sound if it's rooted in the bible it's rooted in what the church has said then you are obligated to respond and it, and it and your response will be a matter of obedience unto you obedience not to us obedience to god and and at the end of the day that's where the line is he singarelli talked about you're going to follow jesus or you're going to follow the devil well he's partially right again jesus talked about counting the cost you're either going to count the cost and follow the biblical jesus though or you're going to follow the the false gospel and the false jesus of mike singarelli and his and his team so which is it going to be Count the cost, follow Jesus, the biblical Jesus revealed in the Word of God, and 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 perhaps God by his grace can bring revival to our land. We're, we're, we should be praying for that. We should be concerned about it. We should be speaking yeah. out about all of these things, which by the way, that's that's one of the reasons I started this specific show is is to is to be speaking out about the things out there because I'm deeply concerned about it. Uh, Don Don mainly speaks on the New Apostolic Reformation. But, but I'm concerned about transgenderism. I'm concerned about abortion. I'm concerned about sex trafficking. Um, I'm concerned about the new apostolic reformation. I'm concerned about the new age. Um, and and so, so we want to expose the works of darkness. And so I commend the desire that the problem is, is that there, there's bad theology. There's erroneous theology being proclaimed here. The Christian though, as a Christian, you've been justified. You've been declared not guilty by God. You've been adopted by God. You are a friend of yeah. God. You are signed and sealed because of the blood of Christ. You yeah. you have every hope and and reason for hope, not because Mike Singarelli said it, but because the Lord, and not because Dave Jenkins said it, not because Don Hill said it, not because anybody else that comes on this show says it. You have hope because of the person and work of Christ revealed in the Word of God. And so our hope, our confidence, is not in a man. It is not in a movement. As Mike would say, he's right, but where he gets it wrong is he preaches a false gospel. They're preaching a false gospel, and you as a Christian need to come out from that. You need to come out from that because this movie, if it, if it doesn't show you even more, 
they're preaching a false gospel. And friends, we're going to talk about this here soon, maybe not in December, but here soon. We're taking shots. Don and I are taking shots. We're, we're starting to get called out by, by even their own leaders. And let me just say something. That doesn't bother me at all. Right. But because we're not attacking them, we're, we're dealing with the, their substance. We're dealing yeah. with the substance of their teaching, of what they say, and behind what they're saying is all these presuppositions. Don't be biblically ignorant. Open your Bible. There is a Bible. You can look, read it. You can read it on Bible Gateway. You can read it at Blue Letter Bible. You can, I'm sure uh, any, any church that you would go to, they'll be glad to give you a Bible. You know, um, you can you can find it on ESV dot dot com or dot org and the ESV Bible app. I mean, there's you can find the Word of God. You can read the Word of God, and and you need to get in the Word of God. You need to. You don't have to be biblically illiterate. You can read the Bible. You can study the Bible. We have so many resources at Servants of Grace to help you to that end. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll kick it back to you, Don. I know I said a lot there. And I got on a little bit of preacher mode. Sorry about that, everybody. But, you know, what do you what do you think, Don? No, I appreciate you sharing all the things you did about the history, just the, the general overview of the history of revival. And I think it's really important that people understand that there is a difference just because someone claims revival doesn't mean that it's true revival. Uh, there can be what's called revivalism that's going on, that, that you're you're working it up and you're manufacturing it. And um so I, I would just encourage those that have listened and thank you for, for taking time to listen. Cause I know that we did a longer episode today, but we both felt like this was a, an important topic to cover. Um, you need to be looking at this and evaluating it for yourself and not just taking our word for it or, you know, the, the opposite, the other opposite side of their word for it. You need to go and say, what does scripture have to say about this? And to to understand that revival is not marked by um, by manifestations, by signs and wonders. I mean, even in Edward's time that he had similar concerns about the the manifestations and things um, that that true revival in the hearts of men and women is marked by the, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's what he has done. There is nothing that you can do to to. Um, to to work up the revival to happen it it happens because god permits it in his sovereignty to to uh bring you to life and to to turn your heart back to him and to um to be brought from spiritual death to spiritual life um in true salvation that takes place so um and i would encourage you to if you're for those that are pushing back <laughs> on on those the demon slayers and others uh you're not a barking dog you're not a barking dog and and take and saying such things to people it just it's it's designed to try to shut you down and to try to get you to where you won't question and scripture tells you that you are to test the spirits that you are um, instructed in scripture to make sure that what you're being taught is lining up with the word of God, because at the end of the day, we want to honor God in his word. And when the word is being twisted and it's being misrepresented and it's being um, presented in a way that is not honoring God, then that matters. Context matters. True doctrine, doctrine matters. This movement in the New Apostolic Reformation, it matters because it's twisting things. It's twisting worship. It's twisting the word. It's twisting our understanding of, of, of authority, of power. It's twisting our understanding of um, God's sovereignty. Um, Satan is being made to be sovereign in this movement. And I, and I will stand on that. Um, and, and we must come back to the truth of the word of God because it matters. So uh, we, we both appreciate you taking again time to listen today. And we hope that this has been helpful and edifying, I hope, and, and challenging to you to go back to Scripture and to test all things. So we'll help you. We're aiming to warn you about these men, about this movement, and we're going to keep speaking up. It matters. Um, the truth matters. Uh, God's Word matters. The sufficiency of Christ matters. Uh, the work of the church matters. And and so we're, we're committed to that end and to equipping you to 
to be able to continue to stand on the authority of the word. So thank you for joining us as always, Don, and thank you for uh, your work on this as well. And until next time, guys, God bless you. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.